Welcome to Work From Your Happy Place, the podcast that equips you with the tools, know-how, and motivation to live your dreams and find your happy place. Be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter for a recap of the week's guests and a preview of what's in store. To sign up, simply text the word happy place with no space to 33444. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the host of Work From Your Happy Place, Belinda Ellsworth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Work From Your Happy Place. I'm your host, Belinda Ellsworth, and today I have an amazing guest with me today, Miss Maria Brito, and she is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, author, and curator. She built a seven-figure business from scratch after quitting a career as a miserable corporate attorney and has built the art collections of celebrities, hip-hop moguls, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, Broadway producers, and more. A Harvard graduate originally from Venezuela, her first monograph, Out There, was published by Pointed Leaf Press in 2013 and was the recipient of the Best Book Awards in both the art and design categories. In 2015, Brita was selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world, and in 2020, she was named by Art News as one of the visionaries who gets to shape the art world. Wow, that is pretty incredible. And I'm so excited to dive into this interview today. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Belinda. I hope I can live up to the expectations of my bio. Sounds so incredible. Yet (laughs) here I am still hustling my way. You know? Isn't that the truth, though? You know, we're all, we always got to continue that hustle because, you know, you get these accolades and you're I always say you're, you're as good as the gig you did yesterday. You always have to keep moving and looking for those new things. But let's go back. Let's go back a bit because the journey is always the interesting part of what shapes an individual and really what leads you onto the path that you're on right now and really com- creating a completely whole new career for yourself. So why don't you just fill in the gaps of this bio and let's uh, dig into the journey. I think it's always interesting to look back because I had uh, this idea that was uh, seated by my parents, but it was a lot of brainwashing that I had to pursue a dependable career. And that was being a doctor or an attorney or an engineer, things like that. And I was really a very creative child. Every child is creative to the truth is, but I was a singer and a performer and an artist and things like that. And could have done anything like in fashion or graphic design and I don't know I had my own world and but with as I got older the brainwashing got stronger and stronger and I had to fulfill the plan that my parents had which was for me to be a an independent professional without any sort of problems around money or career or getting jobs or whatever it was and so I, I was very fortunate that I was able to leave my native country, Venezuela, right before it became a, an in, inhabitable, really, um, communist place. But I left and I went to Harvard Law, and I'm incredibly grateful for that experience. And then I moved to New York in year 2000, and I worked, and I worked in the corporate world, and I worked in corporate law firms because that was what I decided that I wanted to pursue. And I was not happy. I was not satisfied. But in the beginning, I was young and I went with a plan. I said, okay, you know, let me just do this. It's it's very dreamy. New York is and continues to be a very exciting place. And, uh, and it was, for me, the culmination of all this effort and years of studies and whatnot. And by the time I was nine years deep into the practice of corporate law and I was pregnant with my first child. I started questioning for real what what was my future going to look like in a place where I was spending 14 hours, 16, I mean, whatever, you know, when you're an attorney in a big law firm in New York City, and honestly, in any place, you belong to the law firm like a piece of chess and um I, I wasn't happy. I respect lawyers. If there is any lawyer in the audience, I want you to know that this is my story and I'm not reflecting on you, but I was miserable because I did not see meaning or purpose on any of those humongous billion dollar transactions that I was working on. And so for me, it was uh, the combination of having my baby 
and knowing that I was going to have a very short maternity leave and then I was not going to see him again because I saw the partners who worked at the law firm and they were in a in a much more free position, if you will, right? Like, I mean, they were partners that are, they had already proved themselves. They were making a lot of money and they still had no life. So I said, I don't want this for me or my family. And I know that I can do much better on my own if I actually follow my heart and the things that I want to do. And I had always, since childhood, been very passionate about art and art history and modern and contemporary art. And I grew up with that because even though my parents did not believe that pursuing something in the arts was a career, they did believe it was a path to cultivation of intellectuality, uh, nurturing the mind and nurturing the senses. So I had a lot of practical training, if you will. And I had also taken a bunch of art courses, both in school and on my own. So I said, if it's now or it's now or never, right after I have my baby. And I said, I already have a few friends who, you know, sell art or whatever. I have a few connections because I had bought art for myself, but certainly nothing important. It was very superficial. And I, I, I predicted it was going to become a really big market and that the market, the art market needed more people like me at that time to help others understand it, navigate it without being elitist or snobbish, but more like opening doors and inviting people to a conversation, a dialogue, a cultural and historical dialogue, because artists, artists are constantly putting out in the world our reality but they do it with their voice. And it's always fascinating to see our contemporary life and culture through the eyes of artists as it is to look back and see what they did throughout history, because that's what keeps history alive in many, many circumstances and cases. It's not only the written word in books, but also the art and what we see in those images. So I jumped into this business 13 years ago without really knowing how I was going to do it and how I was going to figure, you know, make money and succeed and, and find clients and get noticed. And I think that my naivete of the time was very helpful because if I knew back then what I know nowadays is like I wouldn't have done it you know because (laughs) because I I now I'm an insider of something even though I think I still have a lot of outsider views I am an insider and I know flaws I know people I know certain things I may have gotten jaded I may have gotten tired but I'm not I'm just saying that Once you are in an industry, you get to learn everything and then you're like, whoa, this is weird. But no, if I were to be doing, if I were to choose and and if I could do it all over again, I would. I would do it all over again and I wouldn't change a thing. And uh, it's, it's been the best, by far the best 13 years of my life that uh, I get to do what I love and I get to be passionate about it. And I... I have worked with extraordinary people and have had enormous privilege and success by really putting my effort and talent and energy into something that I find that is so meaningful and important to me, at the same time serving others with what I have. Because I think it's always a relationship between what you believe you're doing and the recipient of what Mm -hmm. you're doing, right? I mean, without clients, without listeners, without you know, with, without audience, nobody could do anything. So I'm, I'm often and constantly reminded that it's about the people. It's not about me. Wow. So give me an idea then. So here you are, you're this corporate attorney. You're making a very good income. I have absolutely no doubt about that. And you decide you're going to leave that and you're going to start this new business. And you have turned this into a seven figure business. So that is pretty amazing. But like, where did you even start? I'm sure many of our listeners are sitting on this show right now thinking, yeah, but how do how does one even start a whole new career in, in something that is completely uh, is polar opposite from being a corporate attorney, probably as you can just about get. 
I started making a lot of lists of of the things that I enjoyed. And mind you, this this as I told you that I started thinking about this seriously when I was pregnant, and I quit when my child was about six months. Right, so it was maybe a year and a half of thinking, and it just accelerated after the baby was born. So I was three months on maternity leave and three months back in the office, and I started making lists of the things that I enjoyed. And by elimination, for example. Um, could I f- work in fashion? No, because I like fashion, but I don't like the people in fashion. And what am I going to do there? Am I going to go to the stores and fold clothes? Even if I, w- not because that was beneath me, because I was ready to do it, but because I knew that I couldn't start a fashion line, I would need millions of dollars. You know, that there was nothing like that. I said, okay, um, should I, what kind of entrepreneur, you know, business I can start where I can do low capital, right? Because I I had 401k, but I had just had a baby and we had a mortgage, all sorts of things that I said, I don't want to burn the money that I have. So it was like low capital. And, you know, what do I need it to make this business succeed was me. You know, I mean, I, I was like the, the most important asset of the business was me. And so I, I took a lot of notes. I did a lot of research. I had phone calls with people who were doing what I'm currently doing. I had phone calls with people who worked in fashion and architecture, people who did all sorts of interesting things in different careers because I I was really at the end of my rope. And I think that when you are in a love in, in that space where you have so much pain about what you're doing and how miserable you are, you become extraordinarily resourceful because it's almost like a matter of survival. So I, I, um, I said, okay, what do I need? I need a website. I need messaging. I need potentially somebody who can help me get some sort of press or something. I need to start partnering with people, you know, and uh, kind of like asking to, let's say, hotel concierges and uh, people in, um, you know, clubs and things like that to see if they refer me clients. And it's funny because it all worked out. I mean, it's it, it may sound outlandish, people, if you're listening right now, that I was able to do it this way because it was very, in a way, very low tech because, I mean, we didn't even have that much of like social media or anything. The only thing that existed back then was Facebook and Twitter. And I hired a web designer and I hired a woman who was a little bit of a PR person, but he was also very good at messaging. And so what caught her attention was that I wanted to democratize, demystify the art world and open it up to people regardless of their class or skin color or whatever. I just wanted to make it accessible, not cheap because I cannot cheapen the value of an asset, but to make it accessible. And and that actually was very striking to her because nobody was doing such a thing. And that had come from my research when I was looking around at the other people who were doing what I do. They were not blogging. They were not mingling with the artists. They were not posting things on Facebook or Twitter because it was so corporate for them. It was so transactional. And I was like, like, I should be doing your job and you probably should be doing mine at the law firm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so I I paid for the for the website. I paid for the photography. I paid the woman for the messaging. And I don't even think that she got me any sort of press, maybe a couple of articles in some sort of like, you know, small blogs or things like that. And then I started working with someone who knew SEO. And mm-hmm. more, so a lot of more things came. Then my husband had a friend who wanted to collect art. So that was like a referral client. Then I went to the hotels to talk to the concierges. And, I, and this is extremely funny. I was, I, I, I had forgotten about this, but let me tell you this very funny anecdote. I got pregnant with my second child, right? In the midst of building the business, right? I got pregnant with my second child. And I'm like on the run with it and doing the whole thing and whatnot. And I go and I talk to a um, a concierge from the hotel uptown. And it's a very fancy five-star hotel and whatnot. And I'm, I'm talking to her on the phone. And she is excited that she invites me. And so I'm maybe I'm four months pregnant or whatever or five. So I wasn't really humongous. And we met in person. She liked me. I never heard from her anymore. 
Uh, the day before I was about to give birth, I couldn't bear, I couldn't walk. Literally, I was so big and tired. I got a call from her and mm -hmm. she's like, listen, hey, would you please come tomorrow? Um, Mr. Pierce Brosnan and his wife would like to buy some art. And I'm like, I am not going to be able to. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's a client that I lost because I never was able to reconnect with them. Um, But, you know, I, other famous people came after. So, um, and the, were very, very good to me. So, you know, I, I lost Pierce Brosnan. If anybody knows him, you might, yeah. you might please tell him that I'm still very open <laughs> <laughs> to he, him and his wife, uh, the one who got away. But, um, you know, I didn't see that as a failure. I just physically could not do it. I mean, You might be listening. Oh, my God, if that would have been my phone call, I would have run down the street. I am telling you, I couldn't do it. And I'm full of energy and I'm a very, you know, intense person. But like the literally the next day, my son was born. So I there I was no I was not in any way, shape or manner able to take that. But yeah, that's how I did it. I there was no event I missed. I showed up everywhere. I went to every art fair. I shake the hands of everybody. And, um, you know, here we go. It's been, it's been, you know, it's, and it's a constant evolution, Belinda, because once you are a business owner, there is always a shift and a tweak and you have to be willing to accept mm -hmm. that the way that business starts is never going to be how the business continues because we live in a world that demands constant upgrades and changes. And, and if you're not on that wavelength, you might as well never open a business or change career because it, it's what, it's what the world is. It is so true. And we're seeing that even more. And so many people have had to shift in these last two years of, uh, of how they even, the way that they did the business and if it was super successful and then, and how they had to pivot and continue to do business in, in a whole new way with clients. So it's, it, you are so right about that. I, I think people are always waiting for it to be sort of this perfect, uh, situation and, and, and the minute that it almost is, it's changing again. So you just, you have to be willing to really roll with it. Uh, and take the new opportunities that come along. Because many times, as long as you have an open mind, you might end up in a whole new stream of income in the same industry you're in, but just in, in, a, new, in a new way. So I think that's uh, amazing. So we've talked about probably one of your, your greatest accomplishments is, is really shifting and changing careers. Do you have one of your greatest challenges that you've faced in this whole, I mean, I love stories. I love the story about Pierce Brosnan. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think the challenge is that it's part of what I said before. When, once you're in an industry and you've been in this industry, like I have been for 13 years, you start noticing a lot of flaws in people. And you also, some relationships may have eroded. You get to, you know, you know, two people maybe too closely more than you should, you know, like things that yep. you, because you constantly see people in this business that I am in. I mean, pre-pandemic, it was like, we would go to art fairs all over the world all the time and run into the same people over and over because it was different inventory and you had different clients. So you have to go and you have to do, and a lot of times it's FaceTime and a lot of times it's intense sales periods. Right. And so I think the challenge is for me, particularly once I am privy to so much information about people and their lives and their business dealings and whatnot, um, You may see them differently, and that's a challenge for business, right? Because you don't want to mingle whatever they do in their personal lives with, like, how they conduct business or, you know, if they're, they've made a mistake at some point, you have to be able to kind of forgive and move on. And because people are entitled to be humans and to and to make mistakes. And so I when I started, as I said before, I was so naive about everything. And nobody could tell me otherwise because if somebody said, don't go to that person. He's a monster. Don't go to that woman. She's a witch. Do not deal with this 
So I just, it, it didn't register because I was doing my own thing and I was building my own narrative. And that helped me tremendously because first I had a level of humbleness in a way in me that I was just, you know, if this person is horrible, well, it's a shame, but I'm going to try anyway, you know, and that's how I went and built a lot of relationships because I was humble, naive and grounded and I needed to shake hands and I needed to put my face out in the world and whatever they were or didn't were, that was not my problem. And, but now I do know so much. And so that's a challenge. And I think it's a challenge for any profession. Once you've been an insider for a little longer than, you know, than just the beginning of a career, you get to start putting a lot of values and judgments on people's lives. And then you have already had a couple of, you know, conversations and a couple of like maybe fights and, and I don't like that, but it's also unfortunately nature and i think in business you try to not burn bridges because the more you build and the more connections you have and they are good and robust the better it is for everybody but you know i mean again things happen and if somebody you know plays a trick on you more than once i think that it's a shame on them but then you have to burn that bridge right and so mm -hmm. yeah i think that's the challenge is how do you keep all these connections kind of fresh when um, you've seen them so much and know so much. And, you know, it also may have to be with like, I'm a passionate person. I'm an intense person, right? If I were to remove every emotion from every interaction and remain like an ice queen, you know, six feet of distance and whatever kind of pandemic style, right? Then I'll be probably a lot more equipped to deal with those things. But I am Latina. I'm passionate. I'm full of emotions. And I think emotions play a very important part in business because people really feel if you are engaged with your energy mm -hmm. or if you're just floating above the whole thing with this attitude of like, don't touch me. I'm the, you know, I'm above. I'm the philosopher. I'm the queen. I don't know. And I'm not. I just want to be down to earth and I want to be friendly and I want to be warm. And uh, and those, I think, are qualities, not uh, not things that are detrimental, you know? Absolutely. And I was going to ask you next, because we like I like to ask about what you think your greatest skill set is. And you've already really kind of outlined a couple of those, but what do you think your superpower is that has just really helped you continue to be successful, really, in no matter what you're doing? I mean, there's those superpowers that are within that allows you to be really successful no matter what you should choose to do tomorrow. My creativity. That's my greatest superpower. Yes, my ability to come up with new ideas of value at each turn. That's awesome. I also just wanted to highlight when you were speaking, because a lot of with the advance, it's it's like it's like social media is a double edged sword. Oh, yes. You know what I'm saying? Because you really outlined for a lot of younger entrepreneurs today that just don't really understand the power of networking. And so when you really talked about, I went to every art fair, I shook hands, I met people, I, you know, I, you were present and you met people and you made connections and those connections is what led you to the next, you know, client or next uh, event or whatever the case may be. And, and people are losing that art of networking by standing behind, you can reach way more people through social media. Uh, for sure. And you can get your name out there in front of a lot of people a lot quicker, but you're not really building those strong relationships. I cannot agree more with that because I think that we have a generation of, um, you know, the younger millennials and the Gen Z have grown up with all this technology and the access to phones and gadgets and iPads and computers since the very, I mean, my kids, I'm, I'm guilty, right? My kids are 13 and 11 and, you know, they had iPads and, and stuff when they were like two and three because we needed to keep them distracted. And, you know, it was supposed to be like the great thing to put them to play games and, you know, connections and crossword puzzles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's 
uh, it's a, it's to their detriment actually to be so connected to these things because they, I mean, my kids are, they are balancing it and I actually put limits on the time that they can use those things and they go to school in person with a lot of people and they get to interact and that's, it's my, it's my pleasure to see them grow and to see them flourish as well-rounded boys but I see a lot of kids who can't even talk to me in my face because they don't know how to hold the gaze steady they are not necessarily having the type of skills that allow them to interact in person with adults or with other kids potentially and it's not just a matter of being shy it's that they don't know how to do it and this is very dangerous because for for human interaction you cannot move everything to a screen we are doing this today because you are in a place i'm in another but i bet that if we were together in the same city we'll probably get together at some point and um but i think that the the whole sort of like although it brings a, a, another connection it's an unrealistic curated um, highly edited type of life, the one that is lived through a screen because you can't see person's flaws, you can't see, or you cannot sense their true energy, you can't have the warmth of an interaction with a person that you like, you don't understand how that person looks or how tall they are or how short. And so I think that, um, and I and my hope is that we can find better ways to educate our youth t- so that they go out a little bit more. And for the ones who actually have taken the steps of connecting with people in person, those are the ones who are the leaders of the future. The rest will be just behind the screen. They might be coders. They might be, but they are not going to be Steve Jobs, if you know what I mean. Like, uh-huh. uh that these guys, uh, as genius and also eccentric as they were, they they were connected to, and they are still like they are connected to their teams in person. Like Elon Musk is walking around his plants every day, as weird as he is, and he's on Twitter tweeting strange things and whatever. But the guy is actually in the plant talking to everybody every day, and he actually moved headquarters from California to Texas, so he didn't have to close the, the, the plant. So this man, he, he means business in a way that is not necessarily the way that other young entrepreneurs and visionaries are absorbing this idea. Yes, you can build a business behind the screen, and for sure, you can do many things without having to go out in the world, but it will never replace a true human interaction, reading a room, reading a face, reading a body, reading, you know, the, the, the normal gestures and, and um, mannerisms and facial expressions and body expressions that people normally do. If you grow up without that, you're missing out on a huge and super important skill that it, it's part of any leader's repertoire and you're also missing out on developing your intuition. If you're never around yes. people, if you're never around people, you don't know if the signals in your body, what they mean. Mm-hmm. That is so true and such an important, um, gosh, that's just such an important detail. It really is because you pick up on those cues. If you're smart and you're watching and paying attention, you absolutely do. So let's talk, though, we're talking about these these differences of networking and and social media, and and certainly it does give you a greater outreach. So what are some of the ways that you do sort of build your fan base or find new contacts through your social uh, media platforms? Uh, Social media is a very important part of any business nowadays, and I think that there there have been a lot of evolutions there, right? I mean, we don't post the same way we used to post in 2005 or 2015. The, the, conversations, the conversations have shifted. And the first thing that I see is that there is a lot more interest in people getting to know your real self and not your super curated, super edited fabulosity all the time. I think that a lot of certain celebrities and certain uh, influencers, if you will, have kept that halo of uh, perfection for a long time. And maybe that's the original audience they cultivated and it's okay to keep it. But 
for a lot of the majority of us, it's a lot of trying to present ourselves in a more a more authentic way and a much more relatable way. So social media, it's a conversation and you have to engage people. And to engage people, you have to actually kind of befriend them, mm-hmm. ask, ask them a lot of questions, uh, hear them back, answer back. Those, those type of things are very, very important. I think that the second thing that is crucial is the consistency. If you haven't posted anything in a month, I don't don't ask why you're not growing. If you still are, <laughs> you know, if you if you still have the same strategy that you were using in 2015 and you are not growing, then I think you have to, you know, Google up what's going on, right? I mean, all the things are always up for upgrading and for being relevant. And being relevant means being in the here and now, right? And and to yep. to provide conversations and information that are for the person that is today, 2021. And and it's fluid, right? I mean, by the end of the year, we may have a whole other conversation and dynamic on the table. And I think that we've had a very intense two years, right? 18 months of Mm -hmm. all sorts of things that we have witnessed and uh, political turmoil and uh, you know, racial issues and so on and so forth. And I think that as much as certain people wouldn't want to touch those topics, they are not necessarily to be ignored. And thus, that's kind of like important no matter what you do, because if I get that, you know, people don't want to get into politics because I personally don't want to get into a political fight with anybody and I'm not a fanatic either of anything. I just, I just want to make sure that I make the point of saying that I I want to engage with people with commentary and relevancy on things that Im- impact the greater good of Americans or society in general. Mm-hmm. And that means that I have to be paying attention to what's happening today. And if I have an opinion, I try to be... Um, expressing of my opinion in a way that is respectful to everybody, but not everybody understands that anymore because the extremes are so extreme that if you even want to be able to say things and open up a dialogue with two sides, the two sides might not even listen to whoever is in the middle because they are blinded by their own views. And it's almost like they just want to live in an echo chamber with all they listen is the same thing. And and that's just like, you know, it's a very, it's a very dangerous place for progress. It is a very, it, it also denies creativity and innovation, which is what I'm all about. Yes, absolutely. So this is our sort of signature question of the show. And that is, what does working from your happy place mean to you? The happy place means a lot of fulfillment, personal fulfillment. When you are in a place of service to others and doing what you love and surrounded by people you like, I think that you've hit the happy place, right? And there is growth because growth can be interpreted in so many different ways. I think that every time you have a small win, that's growth. Every time you have a positive interaction with a client and you get a, a pat on the back or a, a little bit of a flattering comment, that is growth. That is almost like when you water the plants and all those little things are needed. And growth is not necessarily getting a $5 million injection, capital injection tomorrow, although if it is amazing, but that's not necessarily what 99% of the people um, get every day, right? And so mm-hmm. I think that living in, 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 and being and working from your happy place is having all those uh, moments in your day where you feel so much gratitude for what you're doing and you can't even imagine that you would be doing anything else. Right. That's a really great explanation of it. <laughs> so what advice would you give to others that might be in the same shoes that you were in 14 years ago or that want to start a whole new career doing something completely different or are just starting their business out and they just really need some advice on best practices? I think to survive in business and to thrive, 
it, the, the, the one of the most important thing, as I said before, is to striving to keep all your relationships alive and well. And that's your vendors and your clients and the people you serve and whatnot. And, and um, that is crucial, obviously, because you can't do anything without having all this other parts of your business functioning and well. I also think that it's okay when you decide to change. And this is also what I said before, you're going to have to make peace with the idea that you're going to have to shift. And shift might mean you're going to have to close a division. You're going to have to uh, let people go. You will have to probably, um, you will lose money at times. You will have to adjust and you cannot give up every time one of these things happen because they will happen. And it's very important to be able to, to go through that storm without drowning on your boat and saying, oh gosh, I don't know if this is the right thing to do because if you, if you are strong enough in your conviction of what you're doing and you have seen success, it's this just going to be a moment. It's going to be just an, an, an interim moment where things will have to readjust. And that's why you see so many people who actually thrived through the pandemic or they were in a period of darkness and they were able to resuscitate and revive their businesses because they figured out how to adapt to the times that we're living in. And we don't know how many other things are going to happen to us as humans in the next few years because that there is so much that you and I and all of us do not control and that we don't even know why they happen, who is behind them. We don't know anything. What we, do, what we do know is that we are responsible for our actions as individuals and we are responsible for the, for the execution of our ideas. And things just don't happen. We make them happen. Absolutely. So any new and exciting things you're working on? And then how can our audience stay in contact with you or find you? Yes, I'm very excited that in March of 2022, I'm launching a new book with HarperCollins. And it's a book about how I built my business, but it's also a book about how people can use creativity to quit their jobs, open businesses like I did, or pivot their careers. And it's all intertwined with history, with other successful entrepreneurs, with art history, with psychology and neuroscience. So it's a it's a very deep and comprehensive manual on what anyone wants to do to make their ideas a reality and and to see them succeed and so i'm super thrilled about that Ooh, fun. and yeah and uh, people can come to my website mariabrito.com and i have links there to my instagram linkedin facebook twitter and also the sign up for my weekly newsletter called The Groove. And this is a newsletter where I also explore weekly topics on creativity, psychology, business, uh, researches on the latest about how people can improve the work in teams or alone, or how people can utilize their, whatever it is around them, their resources to be better at what they do. And so I'm super proud of that. Uh, project because I know it has given a lot of excitement and a lot of value to the readers because they always email me back and they say how much they appreciate what I'm doing for them. And that's actually the ultimate goal is for you, the reader, the audience to feel that they are learning something, they are being entertained, they are being cultivated, and that there is value and practical things that they can apply to their lives. I like the idea of giving people all these tools that actually have a practical, you know, that they can have an application Mm -hmm. in real life. Absolutely. Well, Maria, this has been delightful. You've been so insightful and I've loved the energy. You've just really brought it today to the show. So uh, (laughs) thank thank you. you. You're the best. Thank you. 
Thank you. And to all of our listeners out there, thanks so much for tuning in today. We appreciate every single one of you. Make sure you subscribe or follow so you don't miss a single great episode. And the best form of appreciation that you can give both Maria and myself is to share this with a friend. We'll see you next time on Work From Your Happy Place. Thanks for joining us at Work From Your Happy Place. If you like what you hear, please share it with your friends and be sure to rate and review us on iTunes or Stitcher. For a free gift on finding your own happy place, please visit workfromyourhappyplace.com and click on the free audio button. Thanks again for listening.